Welcome to The Independent. I am Matt Fortuna, joined as always by my colleague Pete Sampson. We are a few days out from Notre Dame's third game of the season, their first domestic road trip to NC State on Saturday. Pete, you will be on your way there shortly. How are you feeling about getting back on a plane after two weeks ago (laughs) and about Notre Dame's prospects in Raleigh? It, uh, I am excited to have a one noon start yes. two a flight that is about two hours in total that I, and three that I can fly out of South Bend. Um, and I guess if I get thrown for a game that I expect to actually be interesting and competitive. Uh, so that's, I think this is, I don't want to say this is like where the rubber meets the road for Notre Dame this season, but it's we're going to learn probably more about Notre Dame on Saturday than in maybe a quarter and a half than we will have in the previous two games combined. Um, I, and I, it was interesting talking to Jared Parker on Tuesday night. Cause it's, and I asked Marcus Freeman about this on Monday. You kind of want to press them about like, do you know how good you are? Not as like, not any like, man, do you know how good you are? But like, seriously, do you know how good you are? Uh, And they're like, you know, kind of, sort of, but, you know, point taken that they're going to learn a ton about themselves on Saturday against NC State. And, you know, the, the they, you know, Parker and Freeman talked about, you know, misassignments or mistakes that they had against uh, Tennessee State that they may go for touchdowns against Tennessee State. <laughs> against NC State, they, it might be a five yard loss. It might be your quarterback fumbles the ball because they get blown up. Um, so, I think Notre Dame probably has more to get cleaned up than the box scores would suggest. Um, I think that they probably will, but uh, I'm, I am really looking forward to this one. Pro- I mean, look, I get it. The marquee game you will be at of the college football weekend um, down in Tuscaloosa. Not, not Nebraska, not Nebraska, Colorado, <laughs> not Nebraska, Colorado, but um, I, I'm, I'm really, really interested to see what Notre Dame shows out to be on Saturday. Uh, you and me both, you know, I, the old adage, it's like the greatest coaching cliche in the bag full of coach, coaching cliches. You improve the most between week one and week two. And I guess technically that holds true for Notre Dame here. Um, but I do think we'll, I don't know if they'll prove the most, but we'll learn the most between last week and this week. I mean, NC State, it, it, they were very state-like in their win at UConn on Thursday night. You know, they play down to their level of competition. They pulled away late. Brennan Armstrong showed some good things. This is a guy I remember was second nationally, I believe in total passing yards or passing yards per game in 2021. And he did not play in that game uh, against Notre Dame in Charlottesville. And we saw what Virginia was without him pretty much non-functional, at least offensively Uh, Notre Dame, you know, did whatever they wanted on defense. So I think that one was 38 to three. Wouldn't expect that kind of showing uh, this time out, but you know, Brendan Armstrong is back with Robert and I at NC state, who was the offensive coordinator at uh, Virginia two years ago when Armstrong thrived less so last year uh, with a new staff in Virginia. So curious to see his approach, curious to see uh, how Notre Dame performs. I mean, I feel like we we've learned for forgetting how good or bad they might be. Our outlooks, I think on this season have changed if for no, like for, for nothing to do with Notre Dame. Uh, and I say that because like this schedule, which I thought was tougher than it looked at the outset may not be, but it might also be <laughs> like, like Duke all of a sudden <laughs> way to take a stand there, Matt. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'm right for the wrong reasons, but wrong for the right reasons. I mean, I think I said in our preseason show, I believe they go nine and three and of the big three, I thought they would get USC. Now I'm like, they're not being USC, but they're sure as hell might beat Ohio state and Clemson based on what we've seen off one week. I mean, start with Ohio state. I mean, clearly uh, the quarterback position is unsettled there. Um, and again, that's a program probably more than any other, at least under Ryan day, where you look at it and you're like, that's what Notre Dame either isn't or can't be like, they're just a team that every single year is, going to put up 40 points a game and have a first round pick at quarterback. And you're just going to have to hang on for dear life and hope they shoot themselves in the foot. If you're going to have a chance to get these guys again, just one game against a not very good Indiana team, but you've got to feel a little bit better about yourself uh, on September 23rd. If, if you're Notre Dame based off what you see off what you've seen from Ohio state so far in Clemson. I mean, yeah, you know, uh, Notre Dame beat the hell out of them last year. So I don't want to be like, Oh, look how far Clemson fell or, you know, forget what happened to them last time they played mm-hmm. Notre Dame. But the, outside of that Notre Dame game, they did lose. They have lost 
three of their last four games dating back to last year, South Carolina, Tennessee. Um, they won the ACC title game in between then and they lost the opener Monday night. Duke, just a weird, weird game. Um, very disappointing. You know, I think w- when you fire Brandon Streeter and hire Garrett Riley as your OC, the reigning Froyles award winner, you're expecting the offense to really take off. And look, they moved the ball pretty well between the twenties. It was the furthest thing from a crisp operation and K Klubnik just looked lost at times. He looked scared. Um, he, yeah. He looks like he, the, in the same way that I've, you know, I've talked about Sam Hartman feels like he's playing football on the 0.5 podcast speed setting. <laughs> Clay Club, Kate Klubnik is like 3.75 if such a thing exists. Like, I mean, how about sliding before the first goal? Like yeah. in the fourth quarter. I mean, you know, it, he almost got bailed out with the, the targeting call, but you, you got to know not to slide. Like you, you, you get marked down where you begin your slide. And on fourth right. down with contact coming and a penalty coming, uh, you got to be smarter than that. One of many mental miscues by Clemson offensively on Monday night. And I, I'll be curious to see – that's a team that historically last year, notwithstanding has gotten better. I think as the season has gone on um, and obviously they play Notre Dame closer to the end of the season than they do the beginning. I, I will be curious what they look like come November. Cause you know, they, they've got to play Florida state in a couple of weeks. That's, that's going to yep. be the biggest game on their schedule for ACC purposes. If you're getting um, whipped at Duke, like, Everything is in play, basically. In the I, every, ACC. No, everything's certainly in play. I, I think Dabble Sweeney said afterward, like, this first game ever coach where we ran and threw for 200 yards a piece and we lost. And they were like 100 something oh or whatever in those games. Right. Like, the turnovers just can't happen. Like, they move the ball well, not well enough, but like, it, it wasn't broken. It was a team that had nothing but brain farts in the one game you're supposed to not have that. Like, it's the opening game, it's, it's national TV. Um, and, and look, Notre Dame fans, though, we know Mike Elko is a hell of a football coach. I right. mean, the fact it took this guy this long to, to get a good job, and frankly, nothing against Duke, but like Duke was in bad shape when they hired him. Like, I, I, I thought this was a guy who should have had a much better job a lot sooner. Uh, that guy can coach. I mean, winning nine games with last year's roster um, and, and going out there and doing what he did uh, on night one against uh, the ACC favorite in Clemson. Very, very impressive. There's an alternate history where uh, Marcus Freeman interviews for that job later that week if Notre Ooh, Dame does yeah, not there is. Uh, does not promote him immediately. Um, and, and Tony Elliott also, I believe, picked Virginia over Duke and was deciding between the two. And right now, it looks like Duke's the better job, thanks yeah. to Mike Elko. Um, just, just a fabulous job and, and one that makes you makes that game really jump out on Notre Dame's schedule now, especially coming after the Ohio state game, right? In some ways, I think this is a good thing for Notre Dame. Cause like, it's not a trap game. It's everyone's calling it a trap game. Yep. And it's not an overlooked opponent. It everyone knows how good they are and what they're capable of. Cause everyone, the entire nation saw Duke football at its best last uh, Monday night. And they're not going to be sneaking up on anyone anymore. And I think no. you know, that's one less mental thing. Marcus Freeman and the staff has to worry about. Yeah, I mean, you still have to worry about the long walk from the locker room to the stadium. And, like, I know Davo Sweeney was very concerned about that, which seems like some kind of on brand for him. But, yeah, it, I mean, now you, you the schedule went from the big three to, like, the big three plus Duke, right? Like, now you've got four teams that are ranked in the top 25, which came out on Tuesday uh, with, you know, Duke, I think, is at 21, Clemson's at 25, Ohio State's five, uh, and USC is six, Notre Dame's you know, creeped up to 10. So it, um, I don't know if the schedule looks any harder because, you know, I thought Duke was going to be good. I'm not sure is, you know, are, are they as good as they looked on Monday night? Probably not. Is Clemson no, as bad as they looked on Monday night? Probably not. I, I will also say this though, in Duke's fence, they fumbled it away twice in the first half when right. they had chances to score. Yeah. I mean, they didn't play their best ball either. Yeah. It's just like, you know, Clemson, I think had three turnovers, and really missing a field goal of under 30 yards might as well be a turnover um, and a field goal of over 40 yards. So it, like Clemson just looks like they've got whipped in three of their last seven games, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, um, like 20 point losses. So that's, yeah, I, you know, our, your old colleague, my current colleague, Grace Rayner sort of wrote like, is this it? Like, is this, is it over um, for Clemson as like Clemson as we've known for the last 10 years? And I, I feel like it probably is, um, you know, this it's you know, like, look, Notre Dame has, is lived through this. Um, 
just without the Trevor Lawrence story mixed into it. Like if you don't evaluate your quarterbacks properly, if you don't nail it every time, um, this stuff eventually catches up with you. Um, I think in some ways it's catching up to Alabama right now. Maybe it will show on Saturday. Maybe it won't against Texas with Jalen Monroe. Um, you know, it, it's definitely hit Notre Dame where you have Brandon Wimbush and Tyler Buckner and Phil Jacobic, uh, Gunnar Keel, quarterbacks that like you thought were going to be the guy that weren't, um, you know, and then you have to go out and like, and I, I don't, did you see Urban Meyer's comments a couple of weeks ago? Just like about like, all right, Notre Dame really shouldn't have to go get a quarterback from Wake Forest. And I'm like, obviously herbs like I, I yeah like Notre Dame agrees with you on this one like ideally you don't have to do this but when you're in the position it's on you as a head coach to sort of pivot and accept reality as it is and then like make it better and you know that's why Sam Hartman is here because Notre Dame had some bad quarterback evaluations along the way so it's um yeah it's like I look at the schedule and you think I, I'm with you that like Duke no longer should sneak up on anybody at Notre Dame. Um, I, I think that probably relegates Pitt to the true trap game because we're not talking about it. Um, but maybe by that, I, or Louisville, I'm not sure which one, but maybe by that or, point of the season. Or, or Wake, but I know we'll be talking about that one. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely going to get uh, get some run here on this on this podcast and everywhere else. But um, well, what one game that we didn't talk about on Saturday because it hadn't been played yet. Um, I'm did you enjoy Florida state LSU? Um, it wasn't like tragic comedy as it was a, a year ago where it was like a series of missed extra points, but still uh, highly entertaining football. Yeah. You know, I wrote this on the inside zone after the game, which was essentially, I, I thought LSU was very overhyped coming into the season. Not, I, I did not expect that to happen. I thought that game, I thought they, you know, I, I, I didn't have a strong feeling about them winning or losing that game. I didn't think they would no show in the second half the way they did, but I thought, Look, you beat Alabama, that's about as big of a credibility boost as you can get. And I think, rightfully so, Brian Kelly and LSU got a lot of mileage out of that. And it really overlooked the fact that, like, you know, they lost by 27 at home to Tennessee last year. They laid an egg against a terrible A&M team in the finale when the playoff was still very much in play for them. Like, this was a flawed team. I never bought the Jaden Daniels-Heisman hype. Um, you know, I, I wasn't sure the depth would be there again. I, I did not think they would get run out of the building the way they did in the second half. Um, but I thought they were grossly overrated coming into the season, Florida state. Meanwhile, and by the way, you want to like the perfect, like side by side of what, how to do it and how not to do it. Clemson hasn't had a, a Trevor Lawrence or Deshaun Watson, which again, those guys don't grow on trees. They're both generational quarterbacks. And there's a reason they both got championship rings, but they, they haven't had quarterbacks of that caliber. Uh, and they've, I don't know what's happened to them at receiver. That used to be WRU. Oh, like, yeah, like it was just player after play. Like Justin Ross is a freshman. We all remember that. You know, if you're a Notre Dame fan and that like Justin Ross was one of like three guys on that team. And it was like, where are they coming from? What's happened they, to Clemson at receiver is as bizarre to me as what's happened at LSU at corner. Yeah, like, no, I mean, yeah. DBU, right. They did not look the part at all last night. Yeah. Uh, or, or, however many nights ago my days are all screwed up torched by a guy who was lighting up the big 10 east last year like that well that's the that's my point though is like florida state went to the portal and got keon coleman and anyone who watched that guy play against lsu says that's a first round pick Dabo refuses to go portal shopping i know this has rubbed a lot of people within that building the wrong way like dude get with it we know like and you see this with everyone right like you get successful and you get stubborn um and you ultimately have to evolve or change like different conversation for a different day but you know, you watch it if, if you watch it Northwestern Rutgers game on Sunday. And if you did, God bless you. I had oh some of it on my, I, I had on a plane. Um, <laughs> Pat Fitzgerald should be fired for football reasons, if nothing else, because he kept Mike Bajakian as his OC after winning one game last year and three games the year before. Like that offense is mm-hmm. atrocious. They are underdogs at home against freaking UTEP this week. Uh, I know there are other things going on at Northwestern, but you stay mm-hmm. in one place long enough, it's very easy to get stubborn. And I think you mentioned Alabama. We'll, we'll see. I mean, I'm not. I'm not concerned about them yet. But they're the outlier. Nick Saban is the greatest coach in the history right. of college football. He has reset the bar so absurdly high that, oh my God, Dabo Swinney won two national titles. That's incredible. If, if you gave me a list of, if you told me to pick 10 programs that might be win multiple national titles while Nick Saban was still at his peak, 
Clemson would not have cracked that top 10 before right. they went on that run. Like there was no reason that should have happened. Now it's Kirby Smart in Georgia, which I, I think is a little more easy explainable due to geography, history, and being in the SEC. Mm-hmm. But I, I just think, you know, I'm not convinced Bama's done. I mean, I picked them to win it all this year. Now it was a bit of a leap of faith on my part because didn't know who the quarterback would be. But I, I am a believer in Saban. I'm a believer in that defense. Uh, and I don't think the schedule is, is all that challenging, you know, relatively speaking, outside of this coming week. I mean, I think you, you get in with one loss if you're Bama. But, you know, if you're Clemson, I, the ACC clearly has not done its part. And I think that's probably giving Clemson and its fans a false sense of elitism. Be, yeah. I, I mean – they won the ACC going away last year and they lost two non-conference games to Notre Dame and to South Carolina and then got blown out in the orange bowl. Uh, so I just think, you know, you, you got to adapt and adjust in college football. And the, the ones that have been able to do that are, are the ones that are succeeding right now. And no one's done it better than Nick Saban. No one's done pretty much anything better than Nick Saban. <laughs> um, and it'll be interesting to see how Clemson in particular recovers from this. Cause even during their really down year, and again, really down year, they won 10, 10 games in 21, you know, that team stuck together. They won a winning streak at the end of the year. Uh, you never hear of any infighting there. Um, and, and I think, you know, Dabo is a really good salesman and good at convincing his guys that like, you know, they're going to break through as long as they keep, you know, chopping that, that wood, so to speak. So I, I'm curious to see where they'll be at November. Um, we, we, we've seen, th- seen them recover from early season losses before, but but to get essentially laughed out of the building by Duke uh, in your first game with a new coordinator with expectations absurdly high is just yeah. – that's a tough one to swallow. Yeah, as uh, one of our mutual friends pointed out, has Dabo Sweeney ever watched the Notre Dame-USF game from 2011? Because he's watching it right now in front yeah. of his very eyes. Like that's That was the what, game that he coached in last night, so, and that was I'm, very bizarre. I'm going to see who they play next week because I'm getting ready for a, uh, Andrew McCaba to go Gary Gray in the fourth quarter. <laughs> of whoever whoever he's guarding. Um, I imagine they've got an FCS team or someone pretty uh, Yeah, I think it was not a, great a, home, a nobody but. at a group of five at best. Charleston uh, Southern. Oh, it could have been Autry Denson if it was mm, one year earlier. <laughs> yeah, no longer a Notre Dame hook there. But uh, yeah, it's like, I don't know, with – with Notre Dame and the schedule, I still, and I wrote this today, sort of the final thoughts I, or on Tuesday for my final thoughts, just like, I don't want to, I don't want to hear about like the CFP and like 11 and one and all that stuff after this weekend. Like if Notre Dame comes out and they just house NC state, then I think you can kind of start to have that conversation about like, eh, I mean, is Notre Dame good enough to do something like, elite this year um this like this saturday will be the first marker of like all right can you pick them to beat ohio state i think off of ohio state last weekend more likely than it was before week one but if notre dame just whips nc state on saturday to me that's going to be the big marker like you can't just back into beating ohio state you have to go you have to go take that um, and if, if Notre Dame comes out and they just play NC state off the field, which is not unreasonable, um, then that would, that would tell me a ton about where the season may be going for Notre Dame. Yeah. Ohio state has Youngstown state and Western Kentucky, both at home. So, so, I mean, look, Western Kentucky can score the best of them, but, but, you know, clearly yeah. no one to the caliber of NC state, no one you'll really, I mean, those quarterbacks need reps, but no one where you're going to say, all right, these guys are fixed. Um, this game is again, it's, it's not trappy if you label it early on as a trap game, but like even for Vegas purposes, like I, I think that number open under seven or under, and I thought, Oh wow, that's, I'm surprised it's that low. And now you see, I'm looking at 81% of the public money on Notre Dame right now, which is like, should scare the hell out of you. If you're Irish fan, like I, I will, I, I think I'll pick Notre Dame to win, but not cover for that reason alone. Cause I don't think they're going to lose this game. But again, what do we really know about NC state? And what do we think we might know about very Notre little game? Uh, so we'll, we'll see. It should be in a pretty electric environment. Matt, what have you always said is my biggest weakness on fall Saturdays? Well, Pete, I'd say your hair, but who am I to talk? Let's go with your wardrobe. Mm, harsh but fair. As a friend and your co-host, let me tell you about the exclusive clothier of Notre Dame football, ESQ. 
ESQ outfits over 400 professional athletes, celebrities, and Irish players on game day with bespoke clothing that elevates their game off the field. ESQ sculpts every garment with precision, helping you look your best for work, weddings, celebrations, or in your case, Pete, the press box. Listeners of The Independent can get 15% off their first online order by using the code IND15 at checkout. That's IND15, or visit them at their Chicago showroom for a full custom look. Head to esqclothing.com to create your perfect fit. Also, we're going to have Roddy Jones on the show here shortly from the ACC Network and Sirius XM Radio. No one is as plugged into the ACC as Roddy. Pete, I know you've been a guest on his show several times, and uh, I'm curious to hear his overall take on the state of the ACC after week one, which doesn't even get to the realignment stuff. I think hopefully we can we can let that sleep for one one week at least. Well, yeah, and I'm also interested to sort sort of hear what he has to say about, you know, I think it was ACC media days there where Jim Phillips reportedly got up and told the ACC coaches, like, could you beat Notre Dame already? Like, I, I mean, it's just sort of sort of get his vibe on, like, you know, how does Notre Dame fit in there as it's perceived by other ACC coaches? Like, I don't think Dabo Sweeney really cares that much, but even Dave Doran's quotes this week, uh, I just sort of read it in a matter of fact, like I will put up with this, but I don't like it vibes. Like, I think he's like sort of a, a more subdued Pat Narduzzi that way. Um, I don't, I, the, the 28 straight wins, like Marcus Freeman got asked about it on Monday. It's like, look, that's, that's a BK, you know, props to him for doing that. That's incredibly consistent, but I mean, that's, it does speak to sort of the overall talent level of that league that, Notre Dame has been able to play A games, B games, C games, and I would argue even like a D game and still beat ACC teams for the last, what is it, 2017, the last time uh, they lost a regular I, season I, game? I think it was a Miami game, which I yeah, which unexpectedly gave, gave on life to. <laughs> Mike Elko, uh, it all comes back to Mike Elko there, but uh yeah, just like M- Mike how, Elko did not lose that game. <laughs> no, no, lost that game. It was just it was a heck of a pregame speech that was uh, a hot mic, un- unbeknownst to Mike Elko. So, yeah, it's it, um, just sort of like how you know the ACC feels about Notre Dame. Like, look, they're not joining. Okay, like I think we all know that. But you know, do they do they feel like you know? Does do, is the perception that Notre Dame railroaded the ACC into taking Stanford and Cal? Um, that if they joined in full, that the league's revenue distribution problems would be solved. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I, you know, as much as I don't want to talk about conference realignment in season, I'm curious how Roddy feels about like, all right, well, did the ACC act against Florida State, North Carolina, and Clemson by taking these teams? And does that sort of create a situation where they're ultimately going to have to leave? Like, I don't know. It's a it's a it's a tenuous situation for that league right now. Yeah, I think it was more of like these guys are acting against us because they keep announcing, or at least in one school's case, keep announcing yeah. we're 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 shopping, we're open for business, and therefore we need to basically have a plan B for when those teams go. Because if you look at the downfall of the Pac-12, they didn't they were reactive. They were not proactive, mm-hmm. especially after USC and UCLA left. And that among many other reasons is why the PAC 12, as we know it is, is, is dead. Um, I, I do think our friend of the show, David Teal had a column a couple weeks ago saying like quoting the New York times op-ed uh, from Notre Dame's leadership back in the spring and saying like, Hmm, like if only there was a way for you guys to exercise <laughs> something for the greater good and save yeah. the ACC that you're banging mm. the, the table for right now uh, mm. to bring Stanford and Cal in. Uh, you know, it, it is, I mean, it's college sports. Everyone's out for their own. I don't blame anyone for, for doing that. I, I, by the way, I want to correct you. I think you said Dave Doran's more subdued. Pat Narduzzi, no. Like, they're, <laughs> oh, they are very, very similar. May, maybe not as loud, but, like, very, very similar and aligned in a lot of things. And, look, uh, just as I said, like, it's not Notre Dame's business to worry about, you know, making the ACC more money. Football coaches in particular are the kings of tunnel vision. And I think it's perfectly reasonable if every single coach of every sport in that league says, and, you know, particularly Stanford and Cal, if you want to get technical about it, says like, okay, like, why aren't they full members? Like Coach K was calling them out for this in 2014 when they joined to the point mm-hmm. where Mike Bray called up Tom Noy at the South Bend Tribune 
basically sticking it to his mentor and saying like enough already we're in deal with it. Uh, so I get it, especially if you're a coach, like you're looking for an edge and you see someone else with an edge and you can't really make sense of it. Cause it's realignment is it's, it's above ADs even it's certainly above yeah. coaches. So, um, but Dave Dorrit's a perfect guy to like use this as a chip. Um, Cause he's again, much like Pat Narduzzi, you look at two programs that take on the identity of their coaches. They play up to their competition. They play down to their competition. And that's why they've been much better than our, average, but still haven't broken through. He was complaining about the noon kickoff. Like, like are, are, are we past that? Like it's, it's a football game. It has to start at some point. Um, but just like, yeah, D- Dave Doran just seems like he's uh, he's got an axe to grind at all times. Dave Doran is, is Dave Doran, and uh, he's in the. I hope per- Marcus Freeman like- has a laptop on the sideline on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> much like, uh, much like I think Pat Narduzzi is like. Well, I know I, I should I shouldn't compare it this way because Pat Narduzzi is like Pittsburgh. Like the guy doesn't job hop. He never leaks his name out for other jobs. Like that is a city and a school that appreciates a good old meathead and he is that and he can be himself and look he's won a lot of games there he's he's yeah, won ability a he's good won an a- he won an ACC title two two uh, years ago he had a Heisman finalist and first round pick at quarterback Dave Doran's name you see up for every job every single year and I don't know how real a lot of them are but so I, I do think that's where they are a little bit different but you know, Pete, for your sake I'm I still have the Twitter image in my mind of you you looking back at your I want to say it was a Jeep and the I need mud. to find that just everywhere. <laughs> I need to find. I really need to find that. Um, I'm I hoping I there's no hurricane laptop. warnings. No, uh, I think the weather's supposed to be okay this weekend, so we'll uh, we'll see. But yeah, I think I've been on Roddy's show multiple times to talk Notre Dame ACC. Like he's he's plugged into all that stuff, um, and it especially after the way Week One went um, with Duke, Clemson, with Florida State, um, you know, North how does Carolina Ray fit into that mix. Um, he's he's going to have some interesting interesting stuff to say, so I, I think uh, people will enjoy that conversation. Right, second and goal, ball for five. Hartman in the shotgun has estimate to his left, fakes the handoff. Hartman keeps it. Oh, he leaps for the end zone and somersaults in. What a dismount by Hartman and the Irish have their second touchdown. Second and seven. Bryant's the quarterback again, rolling right, threw it away. Intercepted by Clarence Lewis on the far sideline. He's inside the 10. It's a pick six touchdown. Pick City, baby. It's the first defensive score of the year, and Clarence Lewis puts an exclamation point on what's been an amazing return to South Bend for football in 2023. We now welcome in Roddy Jones, uh, former Georgia Tech receiver, now with the ACC Network and Sirius XM Radio. Roddy is, as you can tell by uh, the gear he's wearing right now, is an expert on all things ACC. Uh, New look ACC after this past weekend, Roddy. Welcome to the show, and uh, what do you make of this uh, mega conference now? Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, what do I make of it? Uh, it? It's it's a tough it's a tough question to answer because I think in the larger scale of things and doing what we do, um, you know, as, as as close as I am to the league and talking about the league almost every day, um, the the thing that you're being sold is like basically hey there's there's safety in numbers and there's more money in this for the members that voted uh stanford cal and smu in uh it's tough to be super excited about it though i'm not gonna lie the football product that you're getting is not great um smu is the best of the three uh, the basketball product that you're getting is not great uh, the olympic sports product is great and, but unfortunately that's not what pays the bills that's not what mm-hmm. drives the perception of the league um, and then you get to like the travel part of it and some of the stuff that's been talked about just while it might be creative, you know, there's been some talk about using Dallas as a hub for non-revenue sports, you know, having the you know, Louisville and Notre Dame and Stanford and Cal and SMU all come together in Dallas and play games, you know, or Miami, like whoever. And it feels very Jamboree-ish, you know, it feels very Little League World Series if they do that in, in any sport. So while it may be creative, I'm not sure that it's uh, good from a perception standpoint. But again, it's in the sports that people largely are not paying as much attention to. So it's uh, it's it's uh, mixed emotions. Let's just say that. <laughs> well, before getting into Notre Dame NC State this weekend, I mean, the, the ACC sort of had like a 
up is down, left is right opening weekend with the Clemson Duke game, which affects Notre Dame on both sides of the ledger. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was interested, like what you thought of that, if you saw something like that coming, maybe not 28, seven, but you know, Clemson to a point where, okay, maybe, maybe Florida state is the top dog in that league after what we saw on Sunday night from them. Um, What would you make of opening weekend in the league? I, I wish I was a good enough analyst to have nailed Florida State or Clemson, um, but I missed on both of them, to yeah. be honest with you. <laughs> so um, on, on the Florida State piece, the thing that I was most impressed with that I wasn't sure was going to be able to happen is were they going to be the more physical team? Were they going to be the more athletic team? Against an LSU team that's recruited really well, has really good yeah. players on both sides of the line of scrimmage, uh, and Florida State was. So so I missed on that. And, and that leads me to the Clemson part. I thought Clemson – this would be Clemson's um, sort of a revenge tour. This would be Clemson laying waste to the conference. They are still, from a star standpoint, the most talented team in the conference. They're getting the all-star offensive coordinator in Garrett Riley. Cade Klubnick, I thought, would be much more comfortable in the system. And they've talked so much about his accuracy. Like, what's he the best at? Accuracy. Um, there was a lot of that that we didn't see. Duke looked more athletic than Clemson. Duke looked like they were up to the task. They weren't afraid. And while Clemson's defensive line was more impactful than I thought upon first watch, first watch, I was like, you know, where is this Clemson defensive line? Mm-hmm. They were actually pretty good. Uh, the thing is, Riley Leonard was better. And and the defense uh, as a whole, did they miss tackles? Yes. I thought the linebackers looked a step slow. There'd been some talk about Jeremiah Trotter Jr. being banged up. He looked like he'd been banged up. Um and look, they, the, the secondary was great. They largely took the receivers out of the game with the exception of a couple plays. But Riley Leonard was just that good. So, yeah, it changes my perspective on both of those. I thought Clemson would be more explosive on offense. I wasn't sure how physical Duke, how inathletic Duke could be on defense. And both of those things uh, I was wrong about. Duke was uh, really athletic and physical, and Clemson was not very good offensively. By the way, I believe I introduced you as a receiver. You played for Paul Johnson. I didn't mean to insult you. It's there. all right. No, you're, you're, no. You're, you're, you're I split out some. Back. <laughs> You're an A-back. Nerdy fans all about the triple option place facing Navy every year. Uh, I want to get one more thought uh, on just the state of the ACC right now, especially after seeing Kate Klubnick look as kind of, you know, not good as he did the other night. Outside of Jordan Travis and Drake May, who would you say is the best quarterback in the ACC? Riley Leonard, hands down. Not even a conversation. Like, that's it. There will be – and look, if you believe the mock draft people, there's going to be two ACC quarterbacks drafted in the first round in, in – in, uh, when is it, April or May? Uh, and it's Drake May and Riley Leonard. Like, those are the two guys whose names are thrown out first and foremost um, from, a, from an NFL draft standpoint. And honestly, I, th- that, was, that would have been the answer before this weekend mm-hmm. as well. Cade Klubnick still had a lot to prove. Tyler Van Dyke has a lot to prove. Brendan Armstrong, Phil Dracovic, names that we know – but guys that are coming off subpar seasons, Riley Leonard's that guy, man. He is fantastic. And against teams that secondaries aren't as good, he's going to put up massive numbers in the pass game as well. Well, I, I mean, it, the known quantity in the league, Notre Dame's quarterback, Sam Hartman, who was there forever, um, actually played against Notre Dame and Ian Book's first start after taking over the starting job in 2018, which is crazy to think about. But I don't know. I, I was interested in what you've made of his first couple weeks here. And I asked that in the context of like, I think there's some people that when Sam Hartman came up here, like, okay, quote unquote, system quarterback, slow mesh, it's going to take a minute. Maybe he was a product of the system. Other, the other camp is like, well, he's never played with this kind of defense and this kind of offensive line and this kind of run game before. I think that camp so far is proving to be, I think more accurate, but it's Navy, it's Tennessee state. NC State is a different animal. Um, what what sort of your your early impressions of Hartman up here? Is that is anything that he's doing surprising you? Uh, no, I, I think I think how comfortable he looks might be a little surprising, just because I don't know that I anticipated him getting in and looking like he's played in this system for five years, which is kind of how it's looked for the first few weeks. Um, but but this is exactly what you wanted to see out of Sam Hartman, like. The, the, the people who are who are sort of on the doubter crew, like what did what what more would you have wanted? What could you what could have convinced you in these first couple of weeks? He's been excellent. He's been great. Now, we understand what those defenses are. Navy's not a very good team and Tennessee State is obviously at a lower level. But this is what you expect. And so I don't think you can take away from anything that he's done because of the level of competition. I thought he's looked incredibly comfortable. My biggest question at Wake, he did struggle in the drop back passing game. 
some of that was the way that it was structured, but some of that was him. It just, he just was not comfortable. He was much more comfortable, you know, in that slow mesh, releasing the ball a couple yards behind the line of scrimmage. Um, and, and it was kind of shots and then, and then, you know, little slant glance routes are out. He's really shown a command of being able to throw to all parts of the field, which is not something he was asked to do on a regular basis at Wake Forest. So I've been really impressed. And, and I don't know that I'm surprised, but I also don't know that I could have anticipated him looking this comfortable. It's been only one game for another ACC transfer, Brendan Armstrong at NC State. I think if I asked you that question a couple of years ago, who would be one of the top quarterbacks in the league, he probably would have been right there. Now he's kind of got to reprove himself at NC State. Did you get a chance to watch film from, from the opener last Thursday at UConn? And what do you expect from Brendan Armstrong with the Wolfpack? Yeah, I, I absolutely did. Um, the I expect Brendan Armstrong to put up big numbers. I don't want to see him. I, I would love if he didn't run quite as much as he did against UConn. Um, and I thought some of that was comfort with the receivers and the defense. UConn's defense is stingy, like, and they are good. Jim Moore Jr. is really – he's a really good defensive mind. So they do offer you some stuff that's going to challenge you. The thing that bailed NC State out a lot in that UConn game was Brendan Armstrong's legs. And that's, the, you know, I think he had 19 carries in the game. You, you certainly don't want him to be mm-hmm. that high, but he's going to carry the ball. Like, he's going to be a double-digit carry guy on a week-in, week-out basis. And you're concerned about him getting hurt. Um, but I think they are less concerned than, like, Virginia was a couple years ago because they still have M.J. Morris as his backup. And M.J. Morris was really good last year after Devin Leary got hurt and before he had his own injury issues. So they've got depth at that position. But, but I expect Brennan Armstrong to really live – in the short timing passing game that Robert and I does so well, that's where he seems to be most comfortable. And if it's not, if it's like one read, two read, and if it's not there, it's gone. He's not going to sit back in the pocket and go through a full four receiver progression. He's going to get a pre-snap read on where he wants pre-snap judgment on where he wants to go post-snap. If the first read's not there, second read's not there, he's gone. Um, and, And so that's what he brings. He brings that sort of, you know, not necessarily gunslinger, but sort of that cowboy mentality, like swashbuckling a little bit where if if I can't throw it here or there, man, I'm taking off and going. And that makes him really hard to defend because he doesn't need much room to pick up a pretty big game. Yeah. I mean, quarterbacks aside, what, what intrigues you most about this weekend's game? Cause I, I know it's not a top 25 game, but it is like, it's where the rubber meets the road for Notre Dame. It's a huge chance for NC state to prove something national television audience. Like what, What's as quarterbacks aside, what's most interesting to you on Saturday? A, a lot. Um, first off, NC State was great against the run last year, and they were really they have a really stout defensive line. They play a three three five defense, so you're gonna see three down linemen for the majority of the game. They'll sub one of those guys out at times on third downs. Um, but their their defensive ends are big and strong dudes, Davin Van and Savion Jackson. And then their nose tackle, C.J. Clark, is a really, really explosive guy, kind of like an Aleem McNeil, not quite as good as Aleem yet, but sort of that mold. Um, but they have two new linebackers, um, uh, Jalen Scott and, and Devon Betty, and they had a little bit of – there were some struggles last week in, in fitting the run. UConn was able to have success against, uh, against them running the football, especially early on. So, I mean, look, NC State's going to have to put on its big boy britches and and defend the run against Notre Dame. And and that's the thing that has really killed ACC teams against Notre Dame. It's the physicality up front and the inability to stop the run. So so can that happen? Conversely, NC State's really good on the back end. They've got big, long corners, Shaheen Battle and Aiden White, both six foot plus, both long. Aiden White was one of the best corners in the conference last year. So the question about Notre Dame, Who's going to merge at receiver? Can they perform against some of the higher level secondaries? This is a high level secondary that Notre Dame's or that that NC State's got. So will Sam Hartman be able to have find those receivers? Can those receivers create separation? And, and then we're going to see the true comfort of Sam Hartman in this offense because NC State's going to show you a lot pre snap that changes post snap. They're going to blitz, and while I have full faith that Notre Dame can pick those blitzes up, can you find the holes behind them? Um, so those are the main things. And then on the other side, you know, the, 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 I think the, the questions are more on NC state side. How good is that offensive line? Uh, will they be able to, to protect Brennan Armstrong for him to on some of those longer reads? What does Notre Dame do about Brennan Armstrong's running ability? Um, and then NC state has some questions at receiver as well. Who are the playmakers there? 
Um, so there's a lot of questions that I want to see answered in this one. Roddy, I think Tony Gibson is one of the most underrated defensive coordinators in the country. I just think he brings it every single year. W what is it about his units uh, in Raleigh that, that make them so stout year after year? N number one, they're aggressive. He coaches linebackers, um, and he teaches those guys to trust their eyes. And so when they see something, they may be wrong, but they are going to be wrong at 110% full speed like they are going to be wrong running through a brick wall which creates issues because you know good things happen when you when you play hard they are as sharp a blitzing team as there is in the country i mean everybody hits their landmarks if a if a if a defensive tackle is supposed to cross face and end up on the inside shoulder of the opposite guard or the guard you know two gaps over he's going to be there and then the linebacker is going to be right behind him, tied off his rear end, coming downhill, right on the inside shoulder of that guy. So they are so sharp, and they can adjust on the run because of the comfort in that defense. Even those two new linebackers that I mentioned, Jalen Scott and Devon Betty, those guys played a ton two years ago when Isaiah Moore and Peyton Wilson were hurt. So they played a lot of football, um, and, and Peyton Wilson's still there. He's one of the more athletic linebackers that you'll see. They've been stout at, at, at corner over the years, and it, they tackle really well at safety. Um, so so it, it's kind of a mixture of everything. Like, they play super fast. He does a great job of being aggressive and picking the spots. He forces you to play behind the chains because he'll do – like, once you cross midfield, expect a first down blitz because he's trying to get you behind the chains. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that he does consistently, and they are just really good at executing um, because they're so well coached. You referenced sort of uh, what's killed ACC teams against Notre Dame, you know, the inability to sort of stop a real power run game. Um, I think Notre Dame's at 28 straight wins, like in the regular yeah. season yes. over ACC yeah. teams. Yeah. And that is commission. that is a perfectly accurate number. Yeah. We, we're keeping track of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I certainly am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you know, and Jim Phillips is keeping track of it. Like I yes. think at ACC media days, he referenced or – I don't know if he said it or coach reference that he said it like, could we just go ahead and beat Notre Dame already? Like I, is the perception of Notre Dame, like uh, an annoyance to the conference, like a, a sort of a, a good revenue generator. Like how is Notre Dame sort of seen as this has evolved over time? And like, it's, it's hard for me to believe that they've won 28 straight games in the regular season over the league. But I think you got to go back to the Miami game in 2017 uh, to find the last time Notre Dame got beat, which they got beat soundly, but it's been all wins since. Yeah, I think amongst the coaches, um, they certainly don't like to see when Notre Dame rolls onto the schedule because Notre Dame is built different than most teams in this league, especially on the lines of scrimmage. Um, the, 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 this league has been a good, has had good players on the line of scrimmage, lines of scrimmage, but it is generally not a line of scrimmage league. Like that's the Big Ten. That's the yeah. SEC. That's why those those conferences, the, the really good teams in those conferences end up being some of the best in the country. The ACC has not generally been that. And, and, and so when you had the teams that can recruit the high-level offensive linemen being down, a Miami, a Florida State, there's not a lot of teams that are going to produce multiple high-level offensive linemen and put together the lines that Notre Dame has seen. So – so in, in one way, it kind of makes sense when you think about it. But in another way, the entire league is rooting for someone to beat Notre Dame. And it would have really helped if it was someone other than Clemson, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah. And, and this feels like a year where the league is better. But one of the measuring sticks about whether or not the league is better is Notre Dame. Because if we keep saying the league is better and you get the win over South Carolina, you get a win over LSU, but then Notre Dame goes undefeated against the ACC – it's not going to feel like it. It's not going to feel like the league is that much better because you still can't get over that team that may not be amongst the elite in the country, but is certainly in that sort of second tier that's going to consistently be between, you know, ranked sixth and 15th. Mm -hmm. That's the type of team the ACC has kind of lacked. And it has been shown by the fact that they can't beat Notre Dame. And this, there's six games this year that Notre Dame has against the league. There's some tough ones in there as well. Right. Some sneaky ones. Add a Duke, a Louisville popping in there. Um, you've got Clemson. You've got a Notre Dame. Like th this isn't Boston College and, and Syracuse and some of the Georgia Tech, like some of the teams that are at the bottom of the league. The Virginia schools, uh, these are teams that are in the upper half of the league. So it feels like this is a year where you got to get at least at least one for five. One for five. That's all we're asking. Uh, so, you know, maybe Jim Phillips will sort of retroactively swap out Wake Forest and Florida State. And like, because <laughs> it's like It'd if there was ever a year yeah, to oh, like, quote unquote, duck Florida State, this is it, which I, I don't think. 
you know, and since this agreement started, I don't think that Florida State has really been like, wow, up. Uh, right. But this year, that, that first that first year, are. that was it. The first year, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Game day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. twenty fourteen when Notre Dame went down there and they were the defending national champs. Like that was it. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's like I do feel like Pittsburgh, Louisville, Duke, and NC State this weekend. State, like yeah. those are all kind of like eight and four ish teams where if you throw out a B minus performance and they're on, like you can get beat. And Notre Dame has sort of had the formula for playing B plus uh, in those games at worst. And that's, that's why they're sitting at 28 wins in a row. I, I would throw Wake in there this year as well. I know it's not going to be overlooked at, because of Sam Hartman, but like Mitch Griffiths, I think is a good quarterback who Wake Forest staff is excited about. And it's the perfect like time on the calendar for, I'm not saying Wake's going to win, but I, I, I think that game fits right in with the Louisville's and Pittsburgh's. I also want to go retro. Yeah. Could we add the Stanford wins since 2018? Mm. Uh, Cause depends, they also Stanford depends. right after Miami. In yeah, they beat, they beat, they beat Cal last year. Should we include yeah, that right. too? Uh, we are we are currently claiming um, Stanford and Cal's wins as part of the Pac-12 being undefeated this year. The ACC is also okay. claiming those. Once they start uh, losing, like then we're in a gray area. We're yeah, gray I mean, area. I don't like if we're going to count Cal as a win, we sort of have to count Stanford as a loss for Notre Dame because they inexplicably we'll lost that. to the Cardinal last we'll year. Oh, that's so right. That's right. Maybe I, Notre Dame's win streak over the ACC is only like at two games. I did See, not intend. And, that was an oversight on my part. Completely, even though we that's why Jim podcast. Phillips is adding yeah. Stanford and Cal. Stanford's got Notre Dame's number. Boom. There you go. That's genius. David Shaw retired. He was done. Yeah. Uh, from a schedule standpoint, though, the other interesting thing is like where Duke and Louisville fall. Duke's after. Mm-hmm. So you get Ohio State, then Duke, then Louisville, then USC. Like that is, that's like one of those stretches that. For Notre Dame, it'd be very easy to look at Ohio State, whatever happens in that game, and then to USC. But you got two teams that are dangerous in between. Yeah, I feel like Louisville is the – like Duke is too good to be a trap after Monday yeah. night, yeah. but Louisville yeah, is not. Um, right. And I think that's, that's what the, the trickier assignment is. Je- Jeff Brom knows how to just win games against teams that he has no business winning against. Like he's yeah. going to pull out all the bag of tricks in, in that game, and um, you know it'll be a good environment. Speaking of environments – is Carter Finley the second best game day environment in the ACC behind Clemson? Oh, man. I mean, it's it's up there, right? It depends on what night you catch Florida State. I, I, um, I can see so, that. So you you catch Florida State on the right night, and it is number one. Um, you catch Florida State on the wrong night, and it's probably number five. Virginia Tech's also up there too. Carter Finley. Okay. Uh, so I would I would go I would go. Clemson, Virginia Tech, one and two, and then it's a battle between Carter Finley and uh, and and Florida State. But look, Notre Dame will. Uh, Notre Dame is is honestly quite fortunate. It's a noon game because Carter Finley and I gets weird. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but it still will be a great environment. It's an awesome stadium. Hopefully, no hurricane this year because that's. Uh, I feel like I didn't get much. I didn't really get the Carter Finley experience in 2016. Yeah where my umbrella is inverting as I'm walking up to the stadium and you're seeing water pool on the turf an hour before kickoff. Um, well, I guess in the, unless there's something else that really grabs your attention, this game, like prediction, like who will uh, put you on the spot here? Like what happens on Saturday? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Notre Dame is too good. I still have questions about that NC state offense. Um, so, so I think Notre Dame probably wins by, I don't know, I'd say it's probably a 10-point win at the end of the game. I think that defense, the, the thing about NC State's defense are the adjustments they make. So Notre Dame may have success on the first or second drive, but then the adjustments mm-hmm. are kind of when things are going to settle in. I just have questions on whether or not NC State's going to be able to score. Robert and I, consistently, Robert and I is going to drop something where they'll have a drive or two where they look really explosive and they'll get down the field. But I think Notre Dame's too good on defense for that to last consistently. So I think Notre Dame... Um, Notre Dame by double digits, um, maybe in one where, you know, a, a touchdown in the third quarter gets us there and then you sort of back and forth down the stretch. Awesome. Well, Roddy, we appreciate you joining us. Enjoy your game this week in Charlottesville. I'm sure it'll be an emotional event there. I yeah. uh, look forward to seeing you down the road the rest of the season. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. Thanks for your flexibility, too. It's great <laughs> to catch up. Thanks, Roddy. That was Roddy Jones of the ACC Network. Um, I think some really good detailed analysis on NC State's defense, like weaknesses and strengths and sort of like the DNA of that program. I think that, uh, at least from my point of view, like I sort of view Dave Dorn as like a caricature down there in some ways. And like they have the quarterback and, but to go deeper than that about the adjustments that, um, you know, Gibson can make 
uh, how and how Jared Parker maybe counters that, I think, is a storyline of this game that I hadn't thought a whole lot about because Jared Parker has not had to adjust in game at all. Um, you know, it's what happens when your quarterback leads 11 touchdown drives in his 12 possessions. So that that will be interesting to me. Um, you know, I think that the test of Jared Parker, I, I think I've sort of looked at this game as more of like, a, all right, Sam Hartman, the offensive line, we're going to see how good they actually are. But I think Jared Parker, the offensive coordinator, is going to come under uh, some game pressure on Saturday that he hasn't so far as well. Definitely. And look, Wake has not lacked for scoring the last times out against NC State and Tony Gibson's mm-hmm. defense. Obviously, the turnovers were the deciding factor last year, but they scored 40-plus points in each of their previous two games. Wake's defense had let them down uh, in, in one of those losses. But, no, Rod- Roddy is – the guy knows football. I mean, he went to levels that, you know, you probably can only get to if you're a former player who's in the broadcast yep. booth meeting with these uh, coaches, you know, pregame, uh, during game week. It was very, very enlightening. Uh, and again, I think we're going to learn a lot about Notre Dame, uh, both good and bad, both on offense and defense. Because, uh, you know, Al-, Al Golden's hit all the right notes, too, through two games so far. Mm-hmm. Now, the challenge hasn't been – I mean, it was unique in, in, when we're talking about Navy. But again, it's nothing that's really translatable to, to what he's going to see from Brendan Armstrong at NC State on Saturday. So I'm curious to see how Notre Dame's defense holds up against that offense. Uh, and then, of course, you know, h- how – I don't want to say how easy because he lost them last time, but you know what, what, you know, 0.5 speeds, what you've been saying for Sam Hartman's kind of uh, speed level while, while running that offense against Tennessee state against Navy. What, what's that going to look like his what probably six time playing NC state uh, in his career. If I'm not Could mistaken. Be. Yeah. Um, it's just like, I mean, as a refresher last year, he was 29 of 48. For 397 yards, two TDs, and three picks against NC State in a 30 to 21 loss. That, I mean, that, there's no way he is going to chuck the ball 48 times. I mean, I would almost be like 29 might be an over under that would be worth engaging in. But I mean, the big difference Wake Forest finished that game 25 rushing attempts for 17 yards. And Wake Forest was minus three in turnovers. So, and they, they end up losing by nine points. So, I think that the story to me is, you know, there's a lot because, you know, what does Sam Hartman's quote unquote struggles against NC State mean? I, I think they mean about as much as the weather the last time Notre Dame played there. Like, it's not the same. Um, it's a different offensive line. I, I look, I, I think Notre Dame's offensive line is a little bit, I don't want to say overrated, but they are not as good as – It's a work in progress. going to be like they're more of a work in progress than the first two box scores would let on. I think Blake Fisher in particular at right tackle has, has struggled a little bit early. Um, that's got to be good because, I mean, there have been a couple moments where Notre Dame has turned people loose against Navy and – definitely Tennessee state where the quarterback gets blown up. If that, if that happens in the wrong moment and the ball comes out, like that's, that's not just a missed assignment. That's like a game changing play. So I'd be wary of that. If I was Notre Dame, I would, I would try to put Sam Hartman under immense pressure, even though I think he's, I think I have him down as like 12 of 12 for basically 200 yards and four touchdowns against the blitz so far this year. But if I was NC state, I would, I would come after him. Less about his own identification and more about can I get Notre Dame's offensive line confused? Uh, can I get their young running backs confused? Um, Jared Parker talked about this on Tuesday night that, you know, NC State, they fit everything really well defensively, but they also sort of like muddy the picture where you're you're not entirely sure what you're blocking all the time. Uh, and that that may give them a little bit of an advantage until Notre Dame can find a rhythm on Saturday. So I was, I was looking back because when you when, when you said Sam Hartman struggles at NC State, I was going to say that was isolated to one game. Yeah, in twenty one, I remember this game because I covered Wake the week before against Carolina. They beat NC State at Wake forty five forty two. Hartman though just twenty of forty seven, two hundred ninety yards, three TDs, three INTs, uh, and he had one rushing touchdown and forty three rushing yards as well. And then uh, in eighteen, excuse me, in nineteen. Wake smoked these guys. Uh, 
but Jamie Newman was the starter in an 18 week pulled an upset. I remember it was a Thursday night game uh, that uh, Jamie Newman also started, I think for an injured Sam Hartman as well. So he's only played them what two, three times, well, three times, uh, yeah. three, three 20, times, 20, 20, 21 and 22. And I think he's two and one, but two like, and one, a lot, a lot of turnovers. Picks. Yeah. Yeah. That's, but the uh, game plan will be lot. completely different. As you said, I mean, Wake Forest and Notre Dame are just built differently on offense. Um, and I think the game will go, you know, we'll we'll reflect that in just the terms of flow the idea of him throwing 47 times unless they find themselves down 21 nothing at halftime or something you know catastrophic i just don't see that being in the cards for Notre Dame this weekend what do you see being in the cards uh for Notre Dame this weekend Pete predicting uh, a win well, and a I cover a little i was a little concerned when i looked at the the forecast and saw there's i think a 50 percent chance of rain on saturday um that's you know kind of gives me the Give me the creeps. It's down to forty percent, but so we're not going to get it. Our long snapper better. was atrocious line yeah. from no, that was Marcus yeah, just straight center. Um, <laughs> or so our straight center, Sam Mustafer. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the the chance of rain in twenty sixteen was one hundred and seventy five percent. So <laughs> it's it's an improvement over that. Um, I I don't think that Notre Dame is going to look nearly as good as they did the first couple of weeks. I think that is fine because you're playing a real opponent who can push back when you push them. Um, but I. I just think that Sam Hartman in this offense, this is going to be sort of the last time people talk about him as a system QB or maybe one of the last times people mentioned the slow mesh because I think he's just going to play very well. Um, and that will be enough to sort of keep NC State at bay in the fourth quarter. I I like the way sort of Roddy saw this game playing out, you know, kind of a 10-point game where in the last five minutes of it, NC State, is like maybe they're driving, but it's kind of one of those drives where if they score here and kick an onside kick, they'd have a chance. Not a if they score here, then like real game pressure is on Notre Dame. So I'll, I'll go Notre Dame 28, NC State 20. Um, I think that – I don't think Notre Dame's offense is as good as it's looked. Um, I think – but I actually I think their defense might be close to it. Um, not three points a game good, but, uh, it wouldn't surprise, it would not surprise me at all if NC state actually ended up scoring in the teens, but, um, I'll go to 20 just cause I think Brennan Armstrong and Robert and I are good for good for a couple touchdowns and a couple field goals. But, um, I think Sam Hartman will be on it on Saturday and that will be enough. It, uh, so I, I like, I think the line is what? Seven, seven, seven. Okay, so I like Notre Dame to cover, and if it 50, was 30, 50 and a half is the over under, yeah, 30 to 20 wouldn't surprise me. Um, but I, I feel pretty good about Notre Dame coming out of this game three and oh. So, you know, last offseason, so the offseason going to 22 when Hartman was still awake, Dave Doran went on this crazy public campaign about how Devin Leary is going to be a Heisman candidate this year. I still have a D. Larry Delivers hat somewhere in my closet somewhere. He's now at Kentucky, but that's neither here nor there. But that rub, I, I don't know for certain whether it rubbed Sam Hartman himself the wrong way, but I know a lot of people at Wake want to say, we beat you guys. Sam Hartman was the second team all ACC quarterback behind Kenny Pickett, and your guy wasn't there. Like, where's this coming from? Like, where's the respect for us? And I have to think some of that rubs a little bit off on Sam Hartman. I know he's not facing Devin Leary, but he's facing NC State, which was a rival at his old school. It's a program that would like nothing more than to knock off Notre Dame. It's a program that brought in the third team all-ACC quarterback from that year uh, in Brennan Armstrong, which right. is really funny if you think about it. Two of the all-ACC quarterbacks that year kind of still in the ACC for different teams. So I, I, I think Sam Hartman and Notre Dame's offense come out uh, with a bit of a chip on their shoulder. I'm going 28-24. I think it's a backdoor cover, and I say that. Um, I think Notre Dame wins. In fact, I'm leaning more toward Notre Dame leaning, winning comfortably than not, but I'm a huge fade the public guy, and the more money that comes in on Notre Dame and the, the refusal of Vegas to make that line anything bigger than seven just scares the hell out of me as far as making this a blowout or, or a double-digit win. So I'll say it's 28-24 Notre Dame, kind of a backdoor cover from NC State. I think Notre Dame's going to get off to a hot start. I think they'll go into halftime up, you know, twenty-one-seven, something of that sort, um, and, and we'll, 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 you know, never really be in jeopardy of losing this game. I just uh, the, the math and the history do not work in Notre Dame's favor as far as picking them to cover here, but I do think they'll win. And I think they'll look the part doing it. Yeah, I, I could see that as well. It's I, 
I think we're sort of in the same mind here about what's going to happen on Saturday. I think it'll be an entertaining game um, yes. in a way that, you know, the first couple of weeks have not, but um, Notre Dame, you know, moving to three and O and obviously four and O after that with central Michigan. And then, then the big one against Ohio state, like that's, I want to, I would like to get to a, that was a September 23rd and just like what the campus feels like. Cause like, that's, you're going to, you get that kind of environment like once every five, 10 years. Um, and, but Notre Dame has to get through NC state to sort of deliver on that promise and what that can be. So it should be a fun one on Saturday. Um, we thank Roddy Jones for coming on the show. Give a, a, a deep dive on NC state. Um, Matt, you're off to Tuscaloosa, if I'm not mistaken. I, I um, am. I'll be at the game day game. Uh, see, uh, Texas, I Alabama. I don't know if we do. We count uh, Tommy Reese as a friend of the pod. I don't know if uh, he, he, I think he, he came was on, on the old ones. One. Yeah, he was on the old I, one. Um, yeah. What's his name? At Texas, the safeties coach. Oh my god. Oh, uh, Terry Joseph. Yeah. Terry Joseph. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, so. Tyler Buckner. Who and Tyler Buckner. Yeah, yeah. But so. uh, that will be a fun one as well. I think that. Uh, We'll probably record our post game Notre Dame podcast before that one kicks off. So we'll kind of hit the, uh, that will Assuming be our Assuming you're not in an eight overtime hurricane filled oh game. Yep. Don't, don't even <laughs> speak that into existence. But uh, we will be back on Saturday with our post game podcast. May even go up Saturday night. I don't want to put any pressure on our producer uh, <laughs> to deliver, but uh, hopefully it won't be a therapy session. It'll be more of like, oh, okay, looking ahead to Ohio State a little bit because, um, Notre Dame gets through this one, they'll be undefeated when Ohio State comes to town toward the end of September, and that will be one heck of a show. So until Saturday, he's Matt. I'm Pete. Thanks for being with us on The Independent. <laughs>